Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. <laughs> Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. <laughs> I actually need water, water. Okay, so this morning we're going to read from Sri Chaitanya Charya Damrita, Wise Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. And I'm reading from one of my favorite sections of Chaitanya Charitamrita, and this is the Lord's tour of South India. So follow along with me. I'm going to read one Bengali verse, and then I'm just going to read the story to you, and then we can pick some topic here and have a discussion. Mm. Okay, here we are. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. This verse is in Sanskrit. I'll just read it to you. It goes, Danyam tam name chaitanam vasudevam Dayar Dra Di Nashta Kushtam Rupa Pushtam Bhakti Tushtam Karayaha. You guys know some of those words, right? Push, pushpa? This is the very first verse of Chaitanya Charitamrita, chapter 7. This is in um, the Lord's Tour of South India. Yeah, this is Madhulia. Mm -hmm. Adi Lila is mostly philosophy, and Madhyam, Lila, Li, Madhyam starts with the Lord's pastimes. Mostly it's pastimes. Yeah, chapter 7, text 1. Now, I'm just reading this one, and then I'm going to keep reading just the English, and we'll get the story. So, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, being very compassionate toward a Brahmana named Vasudev, cured him of leprosy. He transformed him into a beautiful man satisfied with devotional service. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the glorious Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. All glories to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, all glories to Lord Nityananda Prabhu, all glories to Advaita Acharya, and all glories to the devotees of Lord Chaitanya. After delivering Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, the Lord desired to go to South India to preach. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted the renounced order during the waxing fortnight of the month of Mag. During the following month, Palguna, he went to Jagannath Puri and resided there. At the end of the month of Palguna, he witnessed the Dol Yatra ceremony and, and in his ex usual, his usual ecstatic love of God, he chanted and danced in various ways on the occasion. During the month of Chaitra, while living at Jagannath Puri, the Lord delivered Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, and in the beginning of the next month, Vaishaka, he desired, or I'm sorry, he decided to go to South India. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu called all his devotees together, and holding them by the hand, he humbly informed them, you are all more dear to me than my life. I can give up my life, but to give up you is very difficult for me. You are all my friends, and you have properly executed the duties of friends by bringing me here to Jagannath Puri and giving me the chance to see Lord Jagannath in the temple. I now beg all of you for one bit of charity. Please give me permission to leave for a tour of South India. I shall go to search out Vishvarupa. Please forgive me, but I want to go alone. I do not wish to take anyone with me. So he's asking permission to go and search out Vishvarupa. Do you get, does anyone know who Vishvarupa is? His what? 
his elder brother and why is he going to look for him? He took sannyas and he traveled away. And so he wanted to go and meet his brother and now. So he's asking the devotee's permission, please let me go. Until I return from, from Seta Bandhu, um, all of you dear friends should remain at Jagannath Puri. I got it. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, sir. No problem. Thank you very much. Perfect. All right, let me get comfortable here. All right, so here we are. Lord Chaitanya is asking permission, and he's telling everyone, you stay here at their, in ho at their home in Jagannath Puri, right? Just stay home. And knowing everything, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was aware that Vishwa Rupa had already passed away. A pretense of ignorance was necessary, however, so he could go to South India and liberate the people there. So does that mean that Lord Chaitanya was lying to them? God lies? <laughs> oh my God, this guy can philosophize a lie. <laughs> this is a spiritual lying. This is what Guru Kulins do. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, now I understand. Now I understand. The Guru Kul class that lies to cheats together graduates together. <laughs> okay, let us read on. We'll see here. Knowing everything, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was aware that his brother was, had already passed away, but he still used it as an excuse. Why? Because he actually wanted to liberate the people in South India. Upon hearing this message from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, all the devotees became very unhappy and remained silent with sullen faces. Nityananda Prabhu then said, How is it possible for you to guys to go for you to go alone? How is it possible? You think we're gonna tolerate this? Who can tolerate this? That's the exact words. How do you say that in Bengali? Huh? Tulsi, don't you speak Bengali? How do you say it? Oh, your voice. What a perfect excuse. <laughs> you are all, now I know you're all devotees of the Lord Chaitanya because you all lied to me. <laughs> no, I know. I'm just joking. See, in Bengali, you say what? It says, uh, here, let one or two of us go to you. How is it possible? Who can tolerate this? Oh, yeah, here. How, who can tolerate this? That's, you say it in Be Bengali. Kiha saha. Sahaya. Does that sound right, Tulsi? Kiha sahaya. That's, is that how? You speak Bengali? You can speak Bengali, right? Oh. Is that right, Tulsi? But she, well, she looked at it, what did she say to you? Ah, uh, okay. Now she's, the devotees are walking around. What, what, what is it? If devotees are walking around saying this, Keha Sahaya, like who can tolerate this anymore? <laughs> okay, here we go. I won't make any more jokes, you guys. Let one or two of us go with you. Otherwise, who may fall into the clutches, or you may fall into the clutches of thieves and rogues along the way. They may be whomever you like, but two persons should go with you. Indeed, I know all the paths to the different places of pilgrimage in South India. Just order me, and I shall go with you. Wow, Nityananda Prabhu immediately. Two have to go with you, and i got to be one of them. <laughs> Why? Because he knows all the paths. Okay, Lord, the Lord replied, I'm simply a dancer, and you are the wire puller. 
However, you pull the wires to make me dance, I shall dance in that way. After accepting the sannyas order, I decided to go to Vrindavan, but you took me instead to the house of Advaita Prabhu. While on the way to Jagannath Puri, you broke my sannyas staff. I know that all of you have great affection for me, but such things disturb my activities. Do you know the story why he broke his staff? Lord Chaitanya was dancing in ecstasy, like it says here that he usually was in ecstasy. That's how it's just, Lord Chaitanya is described, you know, like somebody who's like usually, what? Usually, like, doesn't want to go to work, usually doesn't, you know, not happy about the relatives visiting, uh, usually, uh, you know, like, well, you know, there's all these things, right, that are, you, you, you know, people are usually like, right? But Lord Chaitanya was usually in ecstasy. So what happened was he was dancing in, in ecstasy, and only two things that Lord Chaitanya had after he took sannyas was his sannyas danda and his kamundalu. It's a, like a pot for water with a handle on it. And so he would give those usually to Nityananda Prabhu, the danda and the kamundala, when he would dance in ecstasy. And it's described like when he would dance in ecstasy, not only would tears would shoot out of his eyes like syringes, and all of his skin the, would erupt, the hair would erupt, but what, some of the descriptions are really amazing, like his body would blow up like a gigantic pumpkin, and his arms and legs would inert, would, would go inside the body like a turtle's limbs come inside, and he would roll on the ground, crying and screaming out Krishna's names while foam would be gushing out of his mouth. You know? That's not the kind of love of God that you know you just find around the block, right? Or found in the bottom of a what? What did we used to find in the bottom? Cereal boxes, they have that. Or what was it? Cracker Jacks had something in the bottom of the box, right? That's not the kind of love of God that you find in the bottom of a Cracker Jack box. So, yeah, so Lord Titania, I mean, we're like th those kind of symptoms he would exhibit. And, um, and so Nityananda had the danda, and Lord Chaitanya was unconscious, you know, in total ecstasy. And then Lord Nityananda, actually, he was really upset that Lord Chaitanya had taken sannyas from Keshavarati Maharaj, who was a Mayavadi. And so Mayavadis carry a danda, a bamboo stick that's wrapped, that's just one stick, eka danda. But a Vaishnava carries what's called a tree danda, like a tree dandi, right? Tree Dundi Sannyas. So the Tree Dundi is three pieces of bamboo, and they are um, represent one's body, mind, and words. And then they are tied together with ten brahminical threads. So it, the three dundas are tied together with three brahminical threads, then they're wrapped with saffron cloth, which is the cloth of a renunciate or a sadhu, and then the top is a curved piece of bamboo that's a cut small piece of bamboo that's heated over a fire and then it bends, and then it's tied to the top, and that represents that the soul is now in complete submission of his body, mind, and words to Krishna. So, but the ekadanda means, their danda represents that now I am Narayan, I am God. And usually, when the devotees would see Mayavadi sannyasis, they get very angry because it's so offensive. And what would happen, so what Nityananda Prabhu did was he said, how in the world did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu take sannyas from a Mayavadi and he's carrying a, 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 an ekadanda, this is just not right, this is so offensive, you know? So he took the danda and he snapped it into three pieces. And he said, okay, now it's a tree danda. But Lord Chaitanya was in ecstasy. So after he snapped the danda into three places and he realized what he had done, he panicked. So he took the, the three broken pieces of danda and he threw them into the Ganges. <laughs> so when Lord Chaitanya came back out of ecstasy, he was asking, oh, where's my danda? Didn't I give it to you, Nityananda Prabhu? And then Nityananda said, oh, you were dancing in ecstasy and then somehow you fell in an unconscious state and you broke the danda and now I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> Again, <laughs> first it was Lord Chaitanya lying here about going to South India to find his brother who's already passed away and now Nityananda Prabhu is lying about the danda being broken. 
my God, these guys just don't stop lying to the Lord. <laughs> so then, you know, Lord, Nith Lord Chaitanya knew that Lord Nityananda was lying. Uh, you know, what do they say? You can't hide your lion eyes. <laughs> so then, so then, uh, so then uh, Lord Chaitanya got really angry and um, he left immediately, said, I'm not taking anybody with me to Jagannath Puri and I'm going to go myself. And he just stormed off very angry. So I'll just tell you a little bit more of the story and then I'll go back here what, what was happening. So look, there was a debt collector, I mean a, a toll collector. I don't know if you guys ever noticed this in India. I'm sure Tulsi's seen it or if you've been to India, Prabhu or others. They usually have these gates that come down and block the road. Like when you go into Vrindavan to see Krishna Balaram, you they block the gate, they block the road. It's like a railroad crossing block, and then they take tax money from you for, for the road and everything, or for whatever. So um, in those days, that, that's how they would collect taxes. Like uh, Madhavendra Puri was carrying the sandalwood, so you know he had to get a special letter from the king that he could carry that uh, sandalwood without being taxed and bringing it from state to state so they would tax everybody as they would go through those crossroads whether they were you know a tax on sandalwood a tax on you know the roads a tax on just coming to the, the air particular area so um, Lord Chaitanya was chanting his japa walking and he was angry so he was kind of like you know very solemn grave and just walking through you know, uh, and walking by the tax collector. So the tax collector saw him and said, oh, look at the sadhu, and he's so seriously chanting. So he didn't even me mention anything. He just opened up the gate and let Lord Chaitanya go through. So then, like, about 15 minutes after that, because he had gone really quick, like stormed off and had gone ahead of everyone else, Nichiranda, Prumadvaita, Charya, so many other devotees. There were about 30 devotees there traveling with him. And um, they came to the tax collector, and the tax collector put the gate down and said, pay the tax. And then they said, they said, but sir, uh, we saw you just let that sadhu go without paying tax and, uh, you know, ahead of us. And then the, he, they, he said to them, but, but he's a sannyasi. What excuse? You guys are mostly grihastas. What's your excuse? And they said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. You know, we've given our life, we've given everything, our jobs, all of our money, everything. We've given it all to, to that sadhu. And, and he, he, you know, we, we don't have anything. So the debt collector says, he thought about it for a minute, and he was thinking, you know how many times I've heard this excuse? <laughs> so then the debt collector, the, the tax collector, he said, okay, okay, let me get to the bottom of this. So he went... He said, you wait, and he went and got Lord Chaitanya. He said, I have to ask you something. You brought him back to the toll booth, and Lord Chaitanya is on one side of the, 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 the gate, whatever it's called, that arm, and the, Panchata, you know, the rest of the Panchatava and the other devotees are on the other side, and they're looking at each other, and then the task collector says, they say that they all know you, and they've given everything to you, and uh, they don't have any money to pay the tax, and Lord Chaitanya was chanting Japa, and he looked at them, and they looked at him, and he said, I only know Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> the point of the story is that when you chant your japa, you're only supposed to know Krishna, nobody else. <laughs> no, I'm just joking around with you guys. But that is partially true. Fifty percent of that I would say is true, unless it's your guru if it's standing there. Or some serious devotee. Or somebody that's named the Shringarupa. So anyway, what happened was uh, then, you know, then Lord Chaitanya, he said, I only know Krishna, I don't know, I don't know them. And then the tax collector said, see, I knew you guys were lying. Now it's Lord Chaitanya lying, Nityananda is lying, and now all the devotees are lying too. Oh my God, man, what kind of movement have we joined? So then, so then, uh, you know, finally they resolved the whole thing. But, um, that's Lord Chaitanya took that as an excuse. You know, he used that as an excuse with what's being brought up here to force the devotees to l let him go alone to South India. So um, he says here that, oh, so now what Lord Chaitanya does here is really beautiful because what he does is he describes how 
all the devotees love for him, he uses those as excuses for why they shouldn't come with him. And he criticizes their love for him as false, as false. So first one he picks on is Jagannanda. So Jagannanda is who in Krishna's pastimes? Satyabhama. There's a beautiful book called Gora Ganadesha Deepika, which describes how all the different associates of Lord Chaitanya are the gopis and the uh, queens and the Krishna's associates. Just like we know, right? Who's Lord Nityananda and Krishna's Leela? Lord Balaram. Who is Advaita Acharya? Mahavishnu. He's a combined uh, incarnation of Mahavishnu and Sarashiva, but generally he's worshipped as Mahavishnu. Who is Gadadhar? Radharani. And who is Srivas? Narada Muni. So one of the special features Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains is that the devotees of Lord Chaitanya uh, are generally present in spiritual forms both in Chaitanya Leela and in Krishna Leela simultaneously. How does that work? You got to ask this devotee sitting here. He'll explain it to you. <laughs> but yeah, so Jagannanda was such a bomb. And uh, so Jagannanda would always complain about Lord Chaitanya out of love for him. So like uh, Jagannanda, he wrote one of the most important books on Krishna's pastimes. And um, you only find pastimes, the pastimes uh, I'm of Lord Chaitanya, I'm sorry, by Jagannanda. What's the name of it? Prema Vivarta by Jagannanda Pandit. And uh, the, according to um, the Vaishnavacharyas, the three most important literatures on Lord Chaitanya's pastimes, the first and foremost is the Chaitanya Charya Dimrita, written by Srila Krishnas Kaviraj Goswami. Second is the Chaitanya Bhagavat, written by Vrindavan Das Thakur, who is considered to be an incarnation of uh, Srila Vyasadeva. The third most important Vaishnava literature on Lord Chaitanya's pastimes is the Bhakti Ratnakar by Nahari Sakar. And then the fourth is Prema Vivarta by Jagarananda Pandit. And there's pastimes in there that you will only find in Prema Vivarta. They're not even mentioned in the other literature. Like uh, once Sarup Damodar Goswami, who was Lord Chaitanya's secretary, and he was the one who like would read things to approve them for Lord Chaitanya to hear them or to approve them for other devotees. Uh, for you know d to um, to disseminate, and he got in an argument with Jagannanda and told him, "Look, these pastimes are too intimate that you're writing. No, you you you, you shouldn't be writing this down." And um, Jagannanda said, "Look, this is my book. I'm writing whatever I want in it. If you don't like it, write your own book." <laughs> So you'll find these kind of stories there. So Jagannanda, Lord Jaitanya complained about him and said, he wants me to enjoy bodily sense gratification. And out of fear, I'll do whatever he tells me. So what this is referring to specifically is once Jagannanda had a pot of pure sandalwood oil made to, for Lord Chaitanya to be massaged with. So all the devotees would bring the gifts for Lord Chaitanya and his servant is uh, uh, Govinda Das, which is a really unique relationship that he had because Govinda was the personal servant of Lord Chaitanya's spiritual master, Ishvara Puri. So generally the servants and the disciples of the guru don't become the personal servants or disciples of their god brothers or of the guru's other disciples. But Govinda did that. So it's a really interesting uh, explanation of Vaishnava etiquette. Yeah, you want to raise your hand? Go ahead. Yeah, let's have a discussion, you guys. Hi, Krishna. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. It's Kaylee. Kaylee. Yeah. Like Rama Kaylee, Krish yeah. Rasa Kaylee. Okay. Just Kaylee. Though. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so you were talking about how, I cannot remember who is speaking, but... Uh, about b someone wanted 
another person to enjoy bodily sense gratification. Okay, that's Lord Chaitanya is complaining about this devotee, Jagannanda. This devotee is such a bama in Krishna's leela, his wife, one of his most intimate wives. Uh -huh. And now she's come in his leela as Lord Chaitanya, uh -huh. and now, but she takes the part, she always is, she criticizes, she, she's very careful with everything that Lord Chaitanya does. So, but one of the things she did was she brought this pot, or he now, right, Jagannanda, such a woman becomes Jagannanda, and she brings this pot of pure sandalwood oil. So this was common because all the devotees would send gifts to Lord Chaitanya. Like most of the devotees were grihastas, right, so they couldn't be with him. So they would send like special food, they would spend, send special gifts, and Jagannanda sent this pot of pure sandalwood oil for Gogovinda to massage him with. I don't know if you ever had a massage with sandalwood oil, have you ever done that? No. Yeah, if you mix sandalwood oil with like tiger balm, it's very common like in Thailand and other countries though, if you get an oil massage, they mix sandalwood oil with like camphor and what else is in tiger balm? There's a couple other things in it that, uh, but anyway, they massage you with it, but it's incredibly fragrant and uh, it's amazing. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that explanation. Do you understand? You get, what's your question? That's yeah. it? No. Um, my question is, what's the difference between bodily sense gratification and spiritual sense gratification? Uh, there's not much. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, here's, I'll, I'll give you a very good example, okay, that may really open our, our discussion. At the time when Pandu Maharaj was killed, so now we're talking about the Mahabharata. So Pandu Maharaj right? He was the, considered the, to be the emperor of the world because his father had died untimely. So you know, right? He was one of three brothers. So there was, the oldest brother was Dhritarashtra, and he was going to be the king. He had the strength of 10,000 elephants, Dhritarashtra. Like um, when after the, uh, the, all of his sons were killed and he moved into the palace, of Maharaj Yudhisthir, um, he still wanted to kill uh, Bhima for having killed his sons, even though the war was over. So Vidura, who is his uncle, and who was a great intellectual, and he's one of the three brothers, he said, look, he told Bhima, uh, all the Pandavas were going up and they were embracing Dhritarashtra. And Vidura told Bhima, don't embrace him. Take this sculpture, there was a stone sculpture that was the size of Bhima, and he said, hand that to, to bring that to him as if he, because he was born blind. And when they put the sculpture in front of, Dr uh, 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 what is his name again? Dhritarashtra, he smashed it into thousands of pieces. So even up to the last breath, he was trying to kill the Pandavas and especially kill Bhima. So he, but he was born blind, so he couldn't uh, become king. So then the next brother was Pandu. And he's called Pandu because he's so white. He's so white. Um, and, then, and then they had another brother who was Vidura, but he was considered disqualified because of his mother was, a, was one of the maids in the palace because the, uh, the, the, the queen, um, she was afraid of, anyway, it's a very deep story. I, I shouldn't go into all the details, otherwise I'll lose you. But okay, so there are three brothers. So now Pandu becomes the king. But Pandu, he was also, they would go into the forest and hunt. And Pandu liked being in the forest with his wife and with, the Pandu, with his kids and staying in the forest and protecting uh, Brahmins and sages in the forest than he did living in the capital city. He preferred being in the country. And um, so on one occasion, they would practice hunting and they would hunt like ferocious animals. Like even today, if you go to Jayapur and you look at the collection of weapons by the Jayapur kings, um, for thousands of years they have their personal weapons and they have paintings of them. Two things you'll notice. One is every picture of every king, every painting of every king, he's got his jo a Joppa bag on his hand. And the other thing you'll notice in all of their weapons, they have weapons where they would, with their bare hands, kill tigers. 
because the tigers were threatening people in the lived in the forest. And so to practice their, their chivalry, they would kill tigers by hand. Even today, in, um, I lived in northern China in a city called Dandong, which is right on the border of North Korea and um, Inner Mongolia. There's one um, Chinese martial artist who's very famous, and every year he goes into the jungles of, si uh, of Inner Mongolia in the Siberian area, and he kills a tiger with his bare hands and brings it back. He doesn't even use knives. So, so, Pandava, so Pandu, he had unnecessarily killed uh, these two Brahmins, and um, w one in particular, I might be getting these stories mixed up, but anyway, just to get you back up to the, where, the point we are, is um, he was cursed that if he ever tries to approach his wife, he'll die instantly for sex. If he ever tries to have sex with his wife or be intimate with her, because by the time when he killed these two, there were two sages, and they had converted themselves into deers through mystic power. They could convert, change their forms. Even in the Chinese literature, it's like that even up till recently, they could change their forms, you know? Just like me, I, I also have this power. You'll see me normally when I'm going to work, and then you see me now. I've changed my form. <laughs> but uh, yeah, even in the Chinese history, uh, I worked with my guru Marjan in Chinese literature, and we were interviewing all these different famous um, Chinese scholars. Even Srila Prabhupada mentioned that the um, Chinese race they, um, it's very interesting because uh, the Chinese themselves say this. The Chinese themselves say they are descendants of the Naga race, of snakes. And Prabhupada said that they mentioned in Mahabharata, they're called Kasha. They're called, they, were, they actually fought against the Pandavas, the Chinese did, but in the Battle of Kurukshetra. A lot of nice Chinese devotees, don't get me wrong. It's not a racial thing. <laughs> so, but what happened was, um, with Prabhupada, he mentions how the Nagas come from what's a, a planet beneath the earthly sphere, but it's still a heavenly world. So they're called subterranean, uh, hellish, I'm sorry, subterranean heavenly planets. So they have features of hell, but they're he considered heavenly because they're very opulent, like the women are very beautiful. You know, people have mystic powers, they can change their forms and different things like that. So these Nagas, um, uh, these, these na the Chinese say that three powerful descendants of theirs, they were Nagas, they came from this subterranean heavenly planet to earth because they were being killed in, a, in an intergalactic battle. This is what the Chinese say. And, um, and they were the ones who originally procreated the whole race, the Chinese race. And Prophet said you can see that because one, their slanted eyes are a natural um, reaction to um, the increase of sunlight on this planet as opposed to where they originally were, you know, born from. Two, Chinese people, no hair grows on their body. Chinese don't shave. You don't see a Chinese guy buying Gillette razors. They might have a couple of, uh, you know, warts that grow hair, or something, some minimal hair growth, but generally ch the hair doesn't grow on Chinese, which is indicative of a, like a, a, a reptiles type of form. Hmm? Okay, so the, the Chinese mention how these Nagas, even up to not too long ago, they would transform themselves into different forms. Just like we read in the Krishna book, and this is documented by people who witnessed this in historical, biographical, and autobiographical literature. So it's not that this is just Indian mythology that somebody made up and this stuff is nuts, but this is even recorded in so many, histori in so many historical references. Just like in the English, m in my culture, we have what are called the sons of Dhanava. The sons of Dhanava were a race of, of elves and they had mystic power, and they were worshipped by the um, Irish and the Scottish and the English, and they could control the weather. And they had superhuman powers. They were undefeatable in war. They could play like incredible music. They, as musicians, they were super handsome or beautiful physically. And if they, they, the, the local people would make offerings to them each year. If they didn't, then the, these sons of Donova, there was what they're called in English. 
Dhanava is a Sanskrit name which refers to the demo demoniac race, but sons of Dhanava, they're referred to, you can Google search them. And um, they could destroy entire, like whole crops with powerful, uh, 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 you know, weather, powerful storms, and they had all kinds of mystic powers. And it's described how they could change their forms. The Chinese could change their forms. It's documented. You know, like this whole thing of the werewolf and this kind of stuff. This all comes out of this literature. And also with Pandu, these two Brahmins, they wanted to have sense gratification. Now we're talking about difference between spiritual sense gratification and material sense gratification. So they wanted to have unrestricted sex, these two Brahmins. So what they did was, with their mystic power, they changed themselves into deer because the animals are not con uh, under the religious codes of, of human beings. And they were having sexual intercourse unrestrictedly. And then Pandu, who was practicing f hunting in the forest, saw the male deer. And they have the, they have, there's, like a, there's like a set of animals that they generally are allowed to hunt. And uh, so he killed the deer, when, the male deer, when it was approaching the female. And then she tr he transformed back into a brahmin, and so did she. And then she cursed Pandu that you ever approach your wife, you'll die, just like you killed my husband when he was approaching me. People that were so potent, their, even their words could destroy your, everything you, you had. So then, um, so then what happened was um, Pandu, Pandu always w lived in very simple, a very simple lifestyle and a very dispassionate lifestyle. But he had two queens, Queen Kunti and Queen Madri. So once they were in the forest, it was springtime, and the weather, the wind will waft through the forest, especially in the spring. There's many types of wildflowers. The fragrance is just amazing. Like you go into the deep forests in the springtime, and the, the sound of the, the rivers and everything, it's very centrally arousing, you know, by smelling the flowers and feeling the cool breezes and, and the sounds of birds and everything. And then you can imagine, right, that as Madri and Queen Kunti, they were so gorgeous, they were unparalleled as beautiful women in the entire world. Queen Kunti, she was actually blessed by Durvasa Muni to, in two ways. One, she will be able to call any demigod to her that she willed, right? So the Pandavas were born by different demigods because her husband was cursed, so she couldn't have intercourse with her husband for a child. So she would call the demigods because a queen shouldn't be sonless. And then the other blessing that she received, she will never look Old, one day older than 16 years of age. So even when she was an older woman, she was ravishingly beautiful. So there's a, there's a discussion, Prabhupada mentions, between um, Krishna and Maharaj Yudhisthira. So another name of Maharaj Yudhisthira is Dharmaraj, and that one who always speaks the truth. What's that name that he had? That mean, one who always speaks the truth. He was, remember Krishna used that against the Kuruvas in the battle of Kutushetra? That, and he called out, he called out, he told, he told Yudhisthira, say that uh, Duryodhana's son, had, Ashvatthama, had been killed. And Maharaj, had never, Maharaj Yudhisthira had never spoken a lie before in his life. And he, he hesitated to do, to, to do that for Krishna, another liar. I'm joking about it. We should look at that carefully, okay? All right, because this is going to touch on your topic too, that m spiritual uh, gratification and spiritual principles are transcendental to morality. That's what we're touching on right now. But so, all right, so um, Maharaj Yudhisthira, he wouldn't lie. Krishna asked him to lie. It said that Maharaj Yudhisthira, when he would walk or when he would ride in his chariot because he was so... Uh, is truthful that his, even his chariot wouldn't touch the ground. It would transverse above the earth because of his truthfulness. Or if he came in the room, his feet wouldn't touch the ground. So then um, he, wouldn't, he hesitated to lie on behalf of Krishna. And as soon as he did that, his chariot went down to the ground. He lost that potency by not surrendering. 
to Krishna's will. And so then Krishna told him, then say the elephant Ashvatthama has been killed because there was an elephant on the battlefield also named Ashvatthama. So he made that lie. And then Durodhana, it broke. Durodhana shattered his heart within his armor. And that's how they were able to kill, uh, I'm sorry, Dronacharya. Dronacharya, their teacher. Otherwise, Dronacharya was invincible. He couldn't be killed. And he had killed like millions of their soldiers on the, even on that day. He was so powerful. So, um, yeah, so sense gratification and spiritual sense gratification. All right, so here's the, the story. So Maharaj Yudhisthir was cursed. So on this particular day, he lost control of himself in the springtime in the forest, and he approached Queen Madri for, for sexual union. And immediately he died because of the curse of this Brahmin woman. And it's when he, he died in her arms, in Madri's arms. And she started crying piteously and calling out, calling out. And Queen Kunti and the Pandavas were nearby there. And the Queen Kunti could hear that. And she came there and they saw, she saw Maharaji Pandu was, had died, right? And so um, at that point, you know, the Pandavas were very young. They were, like Yudhisthira was only 14 years old at that when his father died. So, uh, and he was the oldest of the five sons, the five brothers. So they were crying, and then the sages, everybody came. They performed the funeral ceremony for Marish Pandu, and that's the time when Queen Kunti and the Pandavas were sent back to Hastinapur, and they were put under the care of Dhritarashtra. Thank you. And, uh, all right, so what happened was, there was a discussion between Queen Kunti and Madri. Now normally when a king has multiple wives, then um, this, the senior wife at the time of when his body is burned or in samadhi, she'll voluntarily give up her life out of love for her husband. Because it's said that when a wo woman is so deeply in love with her husband, if she dies at the same time, then she will travel with the soul of her husband to be with him in the next life, wherever he may be, in heaven, in hell, or in the spiritual world. So generally, these princesses these, these, that become queens, they were so much in love with their husbands that they would voluntarily enter into the fire that their, where their husband's body was being burned and embrace the husband's body and give up their lives voluntarily like that. So that was customary. Later it became forced and it became outlawed in India because people didn't want to take care of these girls after their husbands had died. They forced them into the fires with their husbands and it became some hellish perversion. But the actual original culture is something very pure and amazing and it's spiritual. All right. So before, when, when they were discussing what would happen, okay, no, no, when they, they were discussing, okay, Maharaj Pandu had died, Madri was there, Kunti was there. Generally, the senior queen will give up her life with the king, and the younger queen or queens would take care of the children. But because, uh, but, but because um, uh, King Pandu had died embracing Madri, desiring Madri, so they made the decision that, no, you should give up your life, Madri, and follow Maharish Pandu and satisfy his desires, his sexual desire for you. You should follow him. And I will stay and take care of the Pandavas. This is the discussion that they had. And so, yes, yeah, she was so devastated because she had died with her. Yes, right? She also left? And she also thought that Kunti would make a better mother. Huh? Yeah, so Kunti would be a better mother than Madri. I guess Madri was, uh, she got angry quick or something. Like, well, what would be her disqualification for Madri? I, I could never imagine those. But there must have been some reason. She wanted? Right. Okay, so in this particular you know, romantic interlude, the spiritual point is made that gratifying the senses of a religious or spiritual person is pure devotional service. 
Just like when the gopis approach Krishna, they dress beautifully, they, 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 they say so many you know, sensual things, they, they push each other towards Krishna, they, they try to heighten their, what's in Sanskrit it's called smar, they try to heighten their lust, but not their personal lust for their senses, but the lust that they have to gratify Krishna. And that's the difference. The difference between spiritual sense gratification and material gratification is that material gratification focuses on the gratification of our senses or the extended senses of our family or our nation or whatever, but it's, it's, a, it's a petty, selfish desire. Whereas the spiritual gr sense gratification is directed towards the spiritual master. The spiritual master may ask you to do something you won't, don't want to do. But out of love, you give up your personal, petty, selfish gratification and you engage yourself in the higher service of satisfying your spiritual master's senses. And that's true for our mother and father, if they're devotees. Even when they're not devotees, we should s offer respect to all living beings, right? And, and try to satisfy them. But we understand, as what we read right here, Lord Chaitanya was glorifying the devotees as his best friends and dearest family members because they had brought him to Jagannath Puri and allowed him to actually have the darshan of Jagannath. So in the case now, because I think this is a very like uh, vivid case with Madri and Marish Pandu, right? Because normally when we think of some romantic couple, they're just lost in lust and, and sensual desire. But you see how you could never equate that with these great personalities because they're only thinking of the satisfaction of the person that they have given their life to. That's the difference. But it's a fine line. If you were just to look at a devotee and a non-devotee, you know, it would be very difficult to, uh, to ascertain that. We can ascertain, obviously, if somebody is out preaching, selling books, worshiping the deities, chanting the rounds, coming, we can see clearly. Prabhupada also said, you know, when... Uh, he asked my guru, Tamal Krishna Maharaj, when my god brothers come to you and criticize you and question and demand from you why you call me Prabhupada, because Prabhupada was reserved for their guru, Srila Prabhupada's guru, Bhakti Sananta Saraswati Prabhupada. And he said, when my god brothers, the other disciples of Bhakti Sananta Saraswati, come to you and criticize you and question you and criticize me why you call me Prabhupada, what will you say? Because when they first went to India, there were no Iskand temples. There was practically nothing. They stayed in the Gaudiya temple when they first went there. Like in Mayapur, they stayed at the Devam, Devamrita. Uh, uh, what is it? Devananda Pandit Gaudiya Mat. There was no temple in, in Brindavan, no temple in, in Mayapur, no temples anywhere in India, Bombay, nowhere. So they stayed in the Gaudiya Mat. And, and, and already Prabhupada's the, the God brothers were criticizing Prabhupada for being called Prabhupada, and for other reasons, too. And um, so they said, they, he, Prabhupada asked my guru, his disciple, Tamal Krishna Goswami, what will you say? So what will you guys say? There's still some devotees of the Gaudiya Mat living. I, when I first joined, my guru Maharaj used to bring me to Mayapur. This is in 1980 for Jamastami. And, uh, and Prabhupada's Vyas Puja, and about 20 Bhakti Sanatha Saraswati disciples, uh, grew, most of them were sannyasis, some of them were grihasas, a few of them were grihasas, and about 300 of their brahmachari disciples all came and celebrated Jamastami and Prabhupada's Vyas Puja together with us. So there were some that are very appreciative and favorable, but there were some that became highly critical and they wanted to undermine Prabhupada's work and also take his disciples away from them, away from him. So if somebody asks you, why do you call him Prabhupada? That is Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's title. Who are you to take the title of Prabhupada and give, give that to your guru? What will you say? 
Just say nothing? You just sit there? You, any of you? If the shoe fits, wear it. So what you're saying is that Prabhupada, he, the shoe Prabhupada, the na- title Prabhupada fit, so that's why he's wearing it. So the, the, is it, could you just repeat it quickly? Oh, um, Rupa Goswami was also given uh, address as Prabhupada. Bhadi Siddhanta says what he also addressed because they were Acharyas who, who were able to accomplish something which was extraordinary, which order, like, like other Acharyas had not been able to do. Mm, so Srila Prabhupada you. was able to, to do something which was extraordinary. So, uh, so obviously the title was deserved. And that's what Prabhupada, when he asked my Guru Maharaj that question, Prabhupada himself answered the question. He first asked it, and then Prabhupada answered He said, you tell them, uh, you're addressing me as Prabhupada because I've opened so many temples. I've initiated so many disciples around the world. I've translated and printed and distributed so many books all over the world. And that's why you're calling me Prabhupada. Prabhupada actually, he, my Guru Maharaj told me Prabhupada hated the term Jagat Guru. Prabhupada didn't want the devotees to call him Jagat Guru. That's what Tamal Krishnamar said. It's even recorded on lectures here and other places. But Prabhupada, when they would call someone Jagat Guru, Prabhupada said, these men hadn't even gone out of their villages. And they're allowing people to call him Jagat Guru. Prabhupada, that kind of invoked an anger in Prabhupada's heart, this term Jagat Guru. But obviously Prabhupada deserved it too. You know, the devotees aren't calling Prabhupada Jagat Guru and he's never gone out of his village. You know, to sit here on this Vyasasan, which I'm highly unqualified to do, but that what's mentioned in the scripture, to sit on a Vyasasan and to represent Srila Vyasadeva, a devotee, first of all, has to be flawless in that they've never, you know, they don't fall down, they're studying their devotional service, right? They're controlling their anger and their passions and their, you know, all of this. They're, and they're so learned in the scripture, but not only that, they, they have to be a perfect example, they have to be learned in the scripture, but they also have to have traveled throughout the entire world and have defeated every opposing philosophy to the Srimad Bhagavatam. Prabhupada did that, you know. That that's you know, these now we're talking about what the real devotee is. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Prabhupada. That's why Rome Harsana Sutta was sitting on the Vyasasam when uh, Lord uh, mm, Balram he was traveling, going back to the Hastinapur, and uh, he saw there the the um, the associations going on for the Bhagavatam preachings. Wait, your accent's kind of heavy. You got to speak very clear and s- and slowly. When Prabhu's talking about Romaharshana Sutta, who was the father of Sukadev Goswami, and he not Sukadev Goswami of uh, uh, of uh, who? Sutta Goswami. Sutta Goswami. Thank you. Yeah. Of Sutta Goswami, and he was killed by Lord Balaram. Yeah, that will be coming later part, so I'm just going through. So, when uh, Lord Balaram was passing by, so since he was sitting on the Vyasasana, he thought of his supreme. You know, So, yeah, somebody is sitting on the Vyasasana, he is on that time considered to be superior kind of, and he should not uh, be leaving that asana. But on he that time, not, wait a minute, he should not be what? He's he should not be leaving that asana. Oh, he should not be leaving the asana. So, yeah, you, uh, but, I respect the devotion. Yeah, the given. further. But uh, when Lord is present there, so Lord is supreme. So, he should leave the asana. At least he should give the, uh, offer the obeisances. Or, sitting on the asana also, he should pay respect. No? Like, yeah, he, you are the Lord. Saying, uh, no, just uh, ac- please accept my humble obeisances. Kind of. Suppose you are uh, sitting on the asana, 
now your guru maharaj walk away so you will not be simply sitting and addressing our ourself right you will be saying that no, i want him to sit here humbly go, huh? right <laughs> all right i'm going to listen he was he was in so ego that he is addressing 88000 sages rom harsana sota is addressing 88000 sages so lord balram balram is nothing for him so he he ignored him he dis disobey him so lord become angry and he chopped his head you know because no, such kind of kill him with the piece of grass what kusha grass right yeah chopped his head by the kusha he grass the only. grass and he pierced his heart yeah so meaning is here like uh, one who is sitting on the asan he should be very very humble oh my god you guys i'm sorry <laughs> yeah. shouldn't be here i couldn't be. i couldn't resist it he's <laughs> my no, it's, a, it's not for, it's not drove me here. yeah it's not funny no really you guys i'm serious please yeah. forgive me so, i know i'm not qualified so meaning is like uh, that's what uh, what we are talking about that uh, he should be husaiver he should be very very humble in the sense he should be knowing all the shastra as you told so he should be qualified and he should be very very humble to so otherwise see but wait i have one question uh prabhupad okay they the people of in india will criticize probably because prabhupad would criticize them mm-hmm. and prop the indians would say god what how can you be a sadhu sitting on vyasa san you're not humble at all mm-hmm. you're criticizing us a proper practically uh, from my perspective i have never seen a person that has criticized everything and everyone in this world more than shri la prabhupad That's you cannot find a single thing in this world that Prabhupada has not criticized, and anybody who is practicing anything but pure devotional service, Prabhupada has criticized them constantly. That, criticized. That them. is two different things. That's my question to you. Yeah, one is humble, one is criticism. What he was saying that that is the that is the uh, uh, what we can say that is the instruction of a guru. He has to maintain, you know, being guru. so it is said that guru na sasya sajana na sasya pati na sasya pita na sasya janani na sasya deva na sasya means if they cannot liberate you from this material world bondage of the material world uh-huh. they are not guru so the duty of the guru is to chastise the disciples and to the to the audience you know like those who are not following the proper regulative principle or instructions to chastise them it's not like if If something has to be given hard instruction guru has to give that oh, but so, then i don't like you so you only should say nice things about me right. otherwise i don't want to hear your class <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> i'm just joking you guys <laughs> yeah prophet himself he said you know uh, tell them look at my accomplishments so we also um you know we have to look carefully at, at our accomplishments in our in our daily devotional service and evaluate our advancement like that you know it can improve what's unique about prophet's teachings also is that normally when you look at other scholars when they translate bhakti they just talk about somebody's feelings they always talk about feelings you know but prophet translates bhakti as devotional service prophet wanted us to understand that bhakti has to be based on practical activity also you know like that so devotional service is meant to be active but back to kaylee uh you know that question about sense gratification as opposed to um spiritual gratification so one is a selfless surrender of one's self even up to the point of completely surrendering one's body mind and words you know the gopis are glorified for that right that they even surrender their bodies for krishna's pleasure but the surrendering and we were talking about sanyas and lord nitananda right uh, the surrendering of one's body mind and words in submission to the spiritual master the pure devotee the vaishnavas krishna himself and we can evaluate that's not just like a you know 
a cheap thing that, oh, I, I, I'm surrendering my body, and then the person just uses us for some sexual uh, abuse or some illicit sexual thing. You know, that's not what we're talking about. And in the case of Queen Kunti and Madri and Marish Pandu, their relationship is a sacred relationship, and also it was meant to, for them to procreate children that could rule the whole world. It wasn't just, you know, like, like when I was raised going down to the local drive through grocery store and the girl rolls up to your car on her ro roller skates and it's like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm ready to marry you. <laughs> oh, bottom line. Okay, we go, we're, in, we're over time, but shoot, what's the bottom line, please? I need to hear it. Yeah, just to give the borderline for a spiritual sense gratification and material sense gratification. Yes. So, engagement of the senses in the Krishna service is the spiritual sense gratification. And uh, engagement of the senses for our satisfaction, that is the material sense gratification. For example, if I have to engage my eyes just to have the Lord uh, Darshan, how is the outfit and everything, so that's the eyes. Uh, we can engage in the Krishna service. Mm -hmm. Similarly, smelling the flower or incense, we can use that. Yes. And eating the prasad. And so all the senses that can be engaged in the Krishna service, that is the spiritual sense gratification. Whereas the material sense gratification for our satisfaction is only kama, krodh, lobha, moh, matsarya, so these are all things we are doing for our pleasure. But sometimes, you know, mm, what I want uh, to, to uh, conclude with is that sometimes devotional service is not sense gratification. Like, yeah. in other words, like, uh, in other words, um, there was uh, when the Pandavas, when, the, when uh, Dhritarashtra and Pandu and uh, Maharaj, uh, who is the, 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 sa the sage Yamaraj? He becomes the brother of Pandu? Vidura. Vidura, thank you. So, yeah, Vidura, when they were born, what happened was their mother um, was childless. And uh, uh, without, the, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, the story I haven't written in a long time, but it's, um, what, is the, what is their mother's name? Yeah, but before that, the one that was impregnated by, um, by Va Vyasadev, Sachavati. So Sachavati, then she wanted these three girls to be impregnated. So what had happened was they were, ca they were captured by Maharaj. Uh, they were taken by, by Bhima. So Bhima was a lifetime uh, brahmachari. He had taken a vow to... Re Bhishma, thank you. So Bhishma had taken a vow so, so that... His father could be married to such of a T. So such of a T, she was, I mean, this is kind of very detailed, but such of a T was, um, she was born of a, um, on, a, on a boat. And um, she had a very fishy odor, but actually she was a great,